welcome to the Tuesday, December 13th City of Urbana Arts and Culture Commission meeting in the City of Urbana Council Chambers. We need to have a call to order and roll call and declaration of quorum to get this meeting off the ground. Would uh, members say yes if they are present? Uh, Barbara Hedlund? Yes. Bianca Bailey? Sarah Buckman? Yes. Lori Fuller? Yes. Mark Anthony Macon? Present. Alicia Rodriguez? Yes. Heather Rose? Okay, we do have a quorum. We need to have an approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Do we have anyone sharing an approval? Do we need a little more time? Can we have, does anyone, have, a, have you had a chance to, or should we table this till the next meeting since some of us didn't get the meet in, in this? Or do we have an approval on the we minutes? We motion to approve the motion. Do we have anyone? My motion to approve the minutes. Okay, thank you. I'll okay. second. Great, thank you. All in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Thank you. That has passed. Do we have any additions to the agenda today? Or Just changes? one change that Nicole Friedman is not able to make her presentation today for Pride. She'll be coming in January. To January. Thank you. And do we have any public input today, either in person or in the e by email or letters? No? Okay, moving right along. We have presentations today from our grant awardees. Our first one is Lauren Chambers from the Urbana Free Library. Welcome back. Hello. There we go. Now I think you can probably hear me. So I'm just going to be talking real quick about um, the Urbana Free Library's art grant project for this year. It was called Poems Across Urbana. And for that project, what we did is we held uh, four different poetry workshops, two for teens slash adults, two geared more towards um, kids anywhere from preschool to through elementary age. And we also held two of those workshops at the library and then two others were held in local parks, King and Crestview, to make it easier for people who lo lived in those areas to also come to those events. Um, and those workshops were run by three different local poets, Will Rager, Jim O'Brien, and Janelle Davenport Pleasure. Uh, they all did a wonderful job. They taught different styles of, of poetry, and it was all short form poems, because these were supposed to help people get ready to write short poems that would fit on a yard sign. So we're looking at poems that were about four lines long, not much more than that. And ultimately, we had 20 different poets submit their poems to us so that we could share them. And we were able to print out 60 yard signs and we gave those out between, I think it was August and September of this year, and by the end, they were all gone. Um, we do wanna thank the uh, Urbana Park District because they agreed to put some of the signs also in local parks so people could see them there. So we are very happy to be able to, uh, to put poetry all across Urbana. I have po pictures in a little bit that you'll actually see some of the places where these signs were put. Um, but to begin with, I just wanted to show you pictures, two different pictures of some of the activities we did at our youth uh, workshops. So the first one you'll see is kids actually, they're making their own dice and they put words on the dice and then they were going to roll them and they were gonna make poems out of those words. So <laughs> we did some really, uh, this was Janelle Devonport Pleasure's idea, some really creative ideas to get people inspired, get people, um, who maybe thought, oh, I can't make a poem, that's, that's too difficult, I'm not a poet, I'm not good with words, to be like, no, you can play with it, let's have fun with language, let's have fun with the art form. And then the other one was another exercise where kids had these uh, circles and chalk and they drew something in them and someone else had then had to write a poem around the circle 
about what they were seeing in there. So to get people to also interacting with each other and just helping to inspire creativity. Um, and like I said, we had 20 poets. Some of them even uh, agreed to uh, video record their short poem. And I thought I'd share one of those with you today. Let me see if I can get this to play. Bums across Urbana. I write a line for the trees. I write a line for the bees. I write a line for the garden gnome who brings such joy to our little home. This came out of a quatrain workshop that the Urbana Free Library put on. So thank you, Urbana Free Library. And because boats can make up their own mythology, our gnome that day was a little plastic Tyrannosaurus Rex that we found under a tree. And they're shapeshifters, gnomes are. so could be anywhere. Thank you. Just wanted to give you a little bit of taste. It was uh, nice that he ran that workshop and then was inspired by something he saw in it to, to write this poem and submit it. <laughs> so the next one, I just wanted to show you some examples of different places in Urbana where our signs ended up going. Um, we had signs that were seen on Indiana, on Oregon Street, in various parks, in front of people's houses. So just a little bit of a selection there. And then I thought you'd probably want to see some of the poems as well. So I have a selection here. We did encourage people to submit poems in bilingual languages, and we're uh, lucky enough that we did have someone, I believe this is Mandarin. Um, who submitted a poem that was in Mandarin as well, and we were able to do the translation side by side. And we had a wide variety of topics, so people did anything from poetry. We didn't mm -hmm. tell them what the poem was going to be about. We wanted that people to be able to be as creative as they wanted. All we asked is that it was family friendly, because we were going to be putting these out in public. <laughs> um, so you'll see there's our, our tree one that uh, Jim read, but we had a lot that were sort of um, mental health, uh, some very creative ones. I'll let everyone take a look at those. Some that are a little more reverent. than some that require a little more unpacking to get to the meaning of the poem. We had a wide variety of, of different things that were submitted, even though we did say, you know, it has to be short, but that cr covered such a variety of creativity. I was really pleased with the, the poems that we received. What was the age group? Uh, How did it range? I think, believe it was mostly adult range, and I'm taking that just from the, the emails I had back and forth with some of the poets. Um, we did have a number of children coming to some of our workshops, but I don't think we had as many poems submitted by, mm -hmm. by kids this time. Although I did tell poets that we would keep things pretty anonymous for them, so I don't have uh, demographic data on all of the age ranges for our poets. Mm -hmm. But the couple I did end up meeting were, were adults. And then we also got some nice feedback from the poets about their poems, so I wanted to share that um, as well. We had someone who wrote a poem about working with students and shared sort of this nice message. And then the last um, slide I wanted to share was another poet who was just sent us this nice message about the, the project and what it meant to have the poem in the community. Um, and sort of the power of, of art and projects like this, which we wouldn't be able to do without support of the Urbana Arts Grants. So I promised I would keep things short <laughs> for my presentation, so what questions can I answer? I guess I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I was walking quickly over here on Illinois Street and I came across one of the poems. So then I started reading and I said, oh no, I want to finish it, but I have to get over here <laughs> to the meeting. And I was just really thrilled to see that because you know, you're know you not used to seeing a yard sign with poetry. And mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, 
this is wonderful. And I had to keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my plan is to go back and you know catch that poem. But it was just wonderful to see that it was really a nice surprise. Oh, um, good. Walking down down the street to just are the these all on the website? So if we wanted to go to the UF UFL library site. We They're all on our Facebook page. Okay. We put them there so they'd be um, easy for everyone to see. We also have, I believe it's either four or five different poets there as well who recorded videos about their poem that we were able to share too. And they're all posted there. Because we, the one thing that we didn't expect is we had a couple people contact us and say, do you have a map of where all these signs are? Because I wanna walk around town and I wanna see them all. Or someone even said, yeah, I might organize a bike ride. It was like, oh, we didn't think about that part um, because we would just requested that people, you know, take a sign, put it out. We let businesses know they could take them so that we could also have, you know, businesses maybe supporting local arts as well. Um, and thinking back on it, if we'd known people interested, I might have requested that people let us know where they had their sign posted so we could share it. But that was also a, a fun story that people were interested in them enough they wanted to walk around and see all of them. So we made sure that they were online so it would be easy. We also went with the, the yard sign kind of format because you could put it in a yard. But if you don't have a yard, you could put it in a window. And so then it would still fit. And if someone still wanted to display a sign, but they live in an apartment building, they'd still have a way to do it. That's also why we went with something short because we wanted to be able to make the font large so that it would show up better from a distance too. Good thinking. I just want to echo what's been said, that it's, it was so nice to be able to just walking around town and suddenly you encounter poetry. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was unexpected. And also, because it was on one of those signs that we tend to associate with political things or you know some kind of controversial statement or something, it was just so refreshing to be like, oh, it's a poem about gnomes. This is <laughs> yes. great. Um, but I also do think, like when I saw them, I got an, uh, a feeling of a game aspect. Like I did want to go around and find all of them. So I think if you do it again, it would be great if a map could be worked into it somehow. That would be fun. Definitely. If we did something <clears throat> like this again, I would try to put some kind of map together uh, so people could do exactly that kind of thing, especially since it was summer. <laughs> and it, yes. it's, yeah, looking back, yes, that would have been something that I wish I had planned for. Would that limit the spaces, though? Would you want to keep it in only a certain geographic area? Because this way you had a, a wider range of the community, right? We, yes, we made it available to anyone. So anyone who wanted to come into the library and pick up one of these um, could pick out their favorite and then take it home. And we also made sure that, uh, so every, poet, every poem got printed three times, and we offered the, poem, the poet's uh, copy as well so that they could take one home, and if they didn't want it, then we made it available for just anyone to take. So it would, it would mean that maybe if you wanted to see everything, that might be quite a walk, mm -hmm. um, depending on, but I've seen a lot of them um, in this area, well, and a little bit farther too. I do know there was at least one at Meadowbrook for a bit, so. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Sounds like a very clever and imaginative project. Mm -hmm. It was fun, and uh, no matter the pandemic, it meant we were definitely going to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I love the enthusiasm on your face when you're telling us about it too. That that shows us how well it went. It went very well. It was, it was a very fun project to put together, and just to. I always enjoy seeing um, the creativity of local artists and encouraging people to to play with the arts and think of themselves as artists or writers, even if they, they don't, it's like, just give it a try. Give it a try and do something. That's part of why we made the signs anonymous so that if anyone was a little worried, you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you again yeah. for letting us do this. Yeah. So next we have a return visitor, Patrick Singer from the Pygmalion Festival. Welcome back. Hello everyone.
It took me a minute. Might help run an online magazine, but you know, <laughs> might be the extent of my knowledge here with a PDF. Um, yes, once again, thanks for you know supporting Pygmalion every year. I think that that's why we continue to come back here and apply for the grants because we it's very important to us, especially with our event taking place in downtown Urbana. I mean, now pretty much the wide majority of all of our Pygmalion programming happens in downtown Urbana. So it's a big deal for us and for me to sit here and get the support from all of you every single year. And so um, I thought I'd briefly talk about the performances that we had. Um, you know, it's interesting going through this process and, you know, when we apply for the grant, we say, hey, you know, these are the expenses that could be incurred based on XYZ artists or educators or filmmakers or authors that we get. And so it's kind of, uh, it's, it makes it fun for me and my job to be able to pair the uh, arts grant with um, any particular type of artist that we have. And so um, for the last few years, it's been interesting to kind of like piecemeal it and get the right puzzle pieces together that best reflects um, improvements in the way we program, but also um, things that reflect well for the city of Urbana uh, and this arts and culture uh, commission in particular based on um, you know, feedback we've gotten about um, you know, the mission. And so this year we, uh, I was able to kind of split up the funding um, to reflect a couple of things because in years past we've kind of been like, okay, well here's one performance and this is what it goes towards. So this year we were able to use the funding for um, a live music performance and uh, a film screening and author reading and discussion. And so we felt like um, it paired uh, an artistic angle um, with live music, but also educational and uh, free programming, which I know is a big um, a piece of uh, what makes uh, the arts and culture grants so great is that they go towards helping um, fund these things so they can make them free at times. Um, so uh, the first piece of programming that we presented was this amazing singer named Lido Pimienta. Um, at the Rose Bowl on Thursday, uh, September 22nd, which was the opening night of Pygmalion this year. Um, she's internationally known and acclaimed, and um, we were thrilled to be able to have her through on her tour. Um, she's won the Polaris Prize, which is basically the equivalent of um, the Canadian, Canadian Grammy, um, and um, just incorporates a ton of different types of um, uh, musical influences into her into her shows and her music. And so we're always happy to be able to present um, an amazing singer um, that kind of uh, represents a wide range of, um, a wide range of things for our uh, performers, for our lineup, um, but also pair that with a local venue in a downtown area on the opening night with a local performer. So Mermaid Heaven was the opener for that. And then the second thing that we did was uh, present uh, this author who's a, you know, he's, he's more than just an author, he's a writer, um, but James Spooner is a graphic novelist. He's, own, he's known for the, being the creator of Afropunk, um, which is a very highly influential uh, documentary about punk culture and being black. And so uh, he's the co-founder of the Afropunk Music Festival, which is worldwide known. And so we were able to present him with, um, do a film screening of his documentary, which is about an hour long, and then have him stick around and read from his graphic novel, which he was promoting, and um, pair that with um, his kind of local um, connection, which is Mimi Nien, who is uh, one of the, she's uh, with the Gender Women's Studies program at the U of I, and uh, Ayana Contreras, who, is a bit of a, um, she's an author, but she is like very, um, you know, expert in like uh, record collecting and uh, vinyl records and things like that. And so we were excited to have James here from New York uh, promoting his book. Um, he also spoke and uh, did a reading with this other author named Nabil Ayers at Craner Art Museum um, earlier that day. Um, so it was really nice to be able to kind of combine these things that you know, Pygmalion is always trying to strive for, which is how do we present uh, critically acclaimed international and nationally touring artists alongside local talent and local venues and make it educational and interesting and not something that you'll probably ever see in a community like this. So, um, you know, we're always uh, pleased um, to gain the support of the Arts and Culture Commission and so, um, we were really excited to be able to pre present these two things this year. Um, 
and you know we appreciate you all and so I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have do you have samples on your website so that anybody who's watching and is curious they could um, so we've actually cleared the website because we that's what we do after the you can go to this is pygmalion.com slash past mm -hmm. and you could go and click on uh, the previous presenters and you can see where Lido and James are on the website mm -hmm. and so if you're interested in learning more about them that's a showcase of them having performed here um, so they can anybody that's interested can look on the website and find the information about them listen to her music um, read more about James's book and his work and you know obviously he's a uh, very well um, published author and so I wanted to list some of the publications that he's written for um, just kind of as a showcase to his background and so yes okay. um, and then I also um, in the portal I put some photos and stuff from the performances so if anybody else wants to see those I'm happy to okay. sh uh, share more but I know I don't want to give too many attachments you know I know you all have enough to go through <laughs> um, so yes that is visible there okay thank you Mm -hmm. Just a comment. Thank mm -hmm. you for all of your hard work in, in planning and organizing to bring all these talented pe people to Urbana. I think it's always a really cool festival. And how many years have you guys been? This was our 18th year. 18. Mm -hmm. So next year is 19. Uh, would there be any um, anything that you could think of that you would like more support? Um, from? Yeah, from I mean, I, I think that, culture? you know, this funding goes a long way for us. And I think that, um, you know, we're going to continue to ask for as much as we can get just because it really does support uh, independently owned and operated event like ours. And so, you know, we're always looking to kind of expand our footprint and kind of do things a little bit differently. And I think that's why we, you know, we're always focused on presenting free programming and educational programming. And so I think that's what we want to continue to do as best we can, as long as it's financially solvent. Um, and so, you know, we want to do, more, we always want to do more film screenings or more author readings. And sometimes it just depends on the right fit or availability or the budget. And so, yeah, I think when you ask, you know, what, what can the city continue to do and the commission, it's, you know, we're, we're always grateful for the support and we're going to keep coming back and, uh, doing our best to showcase that we're going to continue to do what we do and present really interesting, amazing artists and um, hopefully gain the support uh, once again and just, you know, continue to make Pygmalion grow, especially as we're nearing uh, the 20th year. Um, so, yeah, I think we're always just grateful for that. And so can continue to support us as you can. And I know there's a lot of other very worthy uh, folks sitting behind me and that come every year to ask for funding. And so we're always grateful. What was your attendance like this year? So the attendance was good. I think that, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to say because some people have like passes and they're kind of like mixing around a bit, um, depending on who it is. But, um, you know, there are a few hundred people at the Lido Pimienta show. And then I'd say there are, you know, probably 50 to 100 people at James's reading. And so, you know, those things are kind of hard to track at times, um, but especially it being a free event, um, people come and go. And that's kind of the nice part about the way we do our programming is that it is really tight inside of downtown Urbana. It's like, oh, well, I can pop in and check out 10 or 15 minutes of this reading and then go over to uh, the Rose Bowl and catch a show there or go to Analog to see the poets like Jim O'Brien read. Um, or any number of other things that are happening. So it's always in our best interest to kind of like keep it as tight as we can so people can get as much out of it as they can because, you know, it's three days. It seems like a long time, but sometimes the biggest challenge is making sure things don't overlap too much. And so it's a fine line to balance that. Um, but, yeah, attendance was good overall. Great. How was it, do you know, compared to, like, previous years? Um, it's probably... It's, it's, it's hard to say because this year we had unfortunately we had two of our headliners that canceled um, pretty late notice um, those were supposed to be some of our bigger shows one was supposed to be at uh, Canopy Club um, then another was supposed to be at Cranert Center and so due to really weird circumstances they the, on the artist end they had to cancel their or postpone rather mm -hmm. um, 
So those would have been our bigger shows, but we had a couple of amazing big shows on Thursday and fr or Friday and Saturday night outside at the Rose Bowl. We utilize their outdoor um, staging. And so, you know, there's anywhere from like 500 to 1,000 people at any given night just like catching that show. And so, like I said, sometimes people pop in and they catch like 20, 30 minutes and then go catch something else. So it's very much a beehive of activity. And I think if anyone has seen me while I'm around, they've probably been like, are you okay? You know, they're asking <laughs> me if I'm all right. Um, but, and I say, yes, I'm having a wonderful time. And, um, you know, it's always fun to see people enjoying themselves. And that's always the best part is just being able to bring cool, interesting programming to Urbana. And so, yeah, I think it's, you know, probably on par with years past. Okay. Uh, I was going to say it, it might not be fair to compare it because we did have a pandemic. Right. <laughs> right. And so I th that's, a g that's a great point. And so, um, you know, we're kind of, I think every year Pygmalion just like changes and it learns more about what it even means to do the event. Cause really it just depends on your budget and the type of acts that you have and the venues that you have. And so those are certain constraints that we have. And I think oftentimes just to take a look at the event and see what people's reaction was is oftentimes more valuable than the number of people that were there. Um, I know it's cliche, but you know, oftentimes quality is better than quantity. And so, of course, as a promoter, I want people to be at my shows and I want people to have a good time and be in attendance and that's all well and good. Everyone likes a full room. And so that's always my goal. Um, I have high standards for my work, but um, you know, I think that given the circumstances and like you said, coming back from pandemic, I've been really pleased with the last couple of years of Pygmalion because we've really gotten to, you know, perhaps return it to its roots in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it kind of started out as just like a collection of club shows and um, really showcasing the best uh, spaces that Urbana has to offer, um, you know, given the constraints of whatever the artist needs or whatever you're presenting. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to next year because it's nice that we've done it a couple of years where we have and our plan is to continue to kind of use that footprint that we have and kind of expand and grow where it makes sense. It's, um, you know, it's always a work in progress. And so that's kind of the fun part. So. Any, any other comments? I feel like I'm, I'm captive. I'm oh, you're good. Captive here. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, I'm curious, though, if you, um, what did you find was the best way to reach an audience? Isn't that the million-dollar question? Dollar question? Yeah. Um, you know. Did you find what efforts, what certain efforts were more successful than others? I think people that. People more responsive to getting your, your message? Yeah, I think that um, it's a great question, and I think that's every promoter's question they're asking themselves all the time. Anyone that is like, how do I reach people, or how do I get people's attention, or how do I make people care? And so I think that honestly, the best medicine for that, something like that is just presenting something that people want to see and that like resonates with the community. And so I think that sometimes the hardest part is not um, doing things based on your heart, but what you think in your mind about, you know, who am I listening to? Who are my uh, consumers? And who are the people that are in the community? And what do they like? And so. I think finding that out is um, challenging, but I think that doing shows all the time and Pygmalion is kind of more of a more of a show series now um, in a lot of ways. And like, yeah, we have our one big weekend, but you know, I'm promoting shows year round, and so I think that I'm learning constantly about what what shows do well or what people really liked or what um, style of music. So like for Lido Pimienta, I thought. You know, I've done a lot of music. I've done some music that is kind of within that realm of the genre. And so I kind of listen to that and I say, oh, well, if people are buying tickets to that, that might mean that there's people here that want to see it. And so I'm trying to kind of listen to that um, as my way of like guiding to figure out who my audience is, if that makes sense. You know, as a promoter, I'm always trying to do my best to cover my bases with putting up posters and making social media posts and posting on Instagram or uh, doing a newsletter or, you know, contacting individual groups or like working with Rob from uh, the Folk and Roots Festival to say, hey, we have 
this amazing guitarist, can you help us promote it to your audience? Because, you know, we feel like utilizing our community, or just like kind of the music community and like people that we know are, have kind of like ends with particular types of um, folks that are interested in this sort of thing. Um, I'm trying to kind of utilize those avenues and kind of just, you know, thank the people that helped me get our message out. And I think that always word of mouth is always just like the way to go. Mm -hmm. And I think that booking things that people do want to see, you'll know right away, oh, well, people are excited about this, so must have done my job, I guess. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's always a mystery. I think it's kind of, I wish I had the secret answer to be like, this is exactly how I target everybody. And I think that, you know, people that run Facebook would probably tell you that, oh, you can do it. You know, you just type it in and then your money goes there and then they're, you get those people. And it's like, I think the reality of that is not as simple as they make it seem. Um, so I think just continuing to engage the community that we're in and listening, that's my best way of answering your question about how do I, you know, attract the right people or how do I, you know, promote to the right audiences. And so, I'm always trying to figure that question out, honestly. Um, but I think when things go well, then you take notes. So sure. That's a long answer. Well, it's working, you know? and you're bringing people to downtown Urbana, and that's yeah. the whole point. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, we've we've really appreciated all the work that Rose Bowl has done, and you know, we can't thank those guys enough for, you know, being good stewards to what we're doing because they certainly could just say, hey, you know what, like, we got other ideas, but you know, Charlie and Martin and Carrie and all those folks there, they they get what we're doing, and so they are good, um, you know, they're good supporters of ours. And so just as you all, they support us in different ways, and so it doesn't happen without this community rallying around it, whatever that looks like, you know. We work with Lauren at their Banner Free Library to do a reading with them, and, you know, that's all good. You know, I think that, um, you know, we're focused on kind of like hunkering down in downtown Urbana and just kind of building that again. So well, we thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah, thanks. Next we have a presentation from Marguerite Kosterman from the YMCA for the Urbana Arts Grants 2022. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Hi. I just need just a second to pull up my document here. Um, is there a present mode or something uh, to get out of this? Actually, you just have a, it's just a PDF, so, um, Oops. yeah, you'll probably just have to go to the next one. Okay. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marguerite. I'm coming to you from the New American Welcome Center. Um, I'm the Grants and Special Projects Coordinator at the New American Welcome Center, and I started in August, so mere weeks before Welcoming Week started, which is what I'll be talking to you about today, so hopefully I'll be able to answer all of your questions. Um, so first, a little bit of background. Do we need to run mic a little more? Oh, yeah. Just for, yep. the, for the broadcast? Yeah, yeah. Or just twist it a little bit, it's <laughs> movable. I think, okay. yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, so the New American Welcome Center is located in the heart of Champaign Campus Town, and our mission statement is on the screen. We strive to make our community a place where all immigrants can thrive and flourish, and we do this by engaging local institutions and mobilizing community resources to ensure equitable access to services, economic opportunity, and meaningful belonging. Here are our programs and some of our areas of focus. Um, I won't be talking about these today, but what you can gather from this screen is that Welcoming Week, which happens in September, um, that we put on in Champaign-Urbana, pulls from the ideas and the goals and also the communities um, that these programs engage. So, like I said, Welcoming Week happens in September. It is from the 9th to the 18th. It's a 10-day long celebration, um, and it's actually something that happens globally every year, and we're one of many cities that participate. Um, so its purpose is to bring together members of U.S.-born and foreign-born backgrounds to have meaningful experiences in the community um, and build connections with each other. 
The next slide will tell you a little bit about how Welcoming Week 2022 went. Um, by the numbers, like I said, it's 10 days. We partnered with 31 local organizations um, who all hosted different events and gatherings at their respective places. There were 39 events total. We also showcased 40 immigrant run or immigrant owned local businesses, many of which were in Urbana. Um, and for the business showcase, we provide a coupon book so that folks can get nice deals during the week um, to any of these businesses and hopefully drive traffic to them and increase awareness for them. Um, and overall this year, through all of our events, we had a little under 2,500 participants, um, which was a great turnout. So this is the first thing that I'll be talking about that we were able to accomplish with the funding. Um, we called these Welcoming Week postcards or Save the Date cards. And these really helped us to get the word out um, about Welcoming Week and to also communicate our theme in a concise and visually interesting way. Um, we translate these, or we translated these cards into three other languages. So they're in English, Spanish, French, and Chinese. And these are the needs that we see, or these are the languages that we see the most need for um, with the communities that we work with. So that's why we did that. On the next slide is the pocket guide. So this was the other written or printed material that we were able to get with the funding. Um, it's actually two-sided and it folds and I passed them out to you earlier. So you have one in English and one in Spanish just so you can see uh, how that looks. And these pocket guides allowed us to thank our sponsors and then also communicate our theme and tell folks a little bit more about Welcoming Week. And then the inside had all of our events. And you can see that there are some days that had lots and lots of things going on. Um, and again, I think that the language translation piece and that we were able to print so many of these in different languages was really important for bringing so many members of the community together. Um, I heard from one of our outreach workers who was working on the translations um, that putting them into French, for example, was really important to him because he, uh, he knew that himself a few years ago and also other members of the Francophone community here would not really understand if they don't um, speak very much English, like the purpose or what would be in it for them to come to these events. Um, so we really value having these in multiple languages and also just getting to have our theme and our colors cohesive and make the um, week seem legitimate and like something that you should wanna go do. So uh, finally, we were able to give honorariums to two student and community performance groups who helped us kick off Welcoming Week at the University-wise International Dinner. This has historically been the kickoff event for Welcoming Week and we always have local artists and performance groups come and show off some of their talents. Um, so on the left was Ballet Folklorico, which was one of the groups that we were able to um, give a stipend to. And then on the right is Mirage Ensemble, um, which is a small performance, er, instrumental performance group. Um, so that is all for the funding, but overall, I just wanted to highlight um, different aspects of Welcoming Week and also show you some photos. So we have these photos of our staff enjoying their time off at um, some of the restaurants that we highlighted in our business showcase. And then we have some photos of outdoor events. You can take a second and take a look. We really enjoy <laughs> the September weather, which I know we're all missing right now. And then this is just a snapshot of our staff and their presence at the different events. Um, we usually almost always try to have a table with a staff member at it that has these printed materials that I just showed you, especially at the beginning of Welcoming Week to continue to help get the word out, um, as well as all of the other materials that we try to deliver to the community as much as possible. So we have Know Your Rights cards and information about COVID, um, flyers about our other programs like the Helpline, and other things of that nature, coloring books, um, other fun stuff like that. 
And that is all. Thank you very much. We really appreciated your funding, and we're really happy to see what we were able to do with it. So thank you. Any questions? Any questions? So how many years have you been putting on the Welcome Week? This is our sixth year participating. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably difficult to, a to answer this question because of COVID has changed participation by people in a lot of events, but do you notice a, an increase in, in, in you know, 2,500, 2,500 people is a lot in <laughs> the one week. Um, is there an increase in people coming to the Welcome Center and, and making the Welcome Center much more exposed to the broader community around Champaign-Urbana? Have you noticed a change, or is it hard to tell because of you know the COVID situation? Mm -hmm. I can't tell you um, specifically right now. I do know that kind of like you were saying, we saw an increase this year versus last year when a lot more events were virtual, um, and it was just really good to to be back in person for most of these things and enjoy each other's company. Um, but I don't know, based on other years, what the turnout has been to like say for certain that we had more um, participants this year. But we did have, like you said, a good number of them. Well, anytime you start something new, sometimes it takes a while for the word to get out and then it just catapults and it's more and more people talk about it. So. They yep. know where to find you now. Absolutely. <laughs> That's great. Anyone else? You guys were great to work with. We, we did a cooking class uh, with one of your coworkers and uh, doing a Nigerian cooking class, so that was really fun. And I love, I love seeing the translations that you guys do beyond, beyond the pocket guides. I know you guys do a lot of different translation work uh, for previous grants. and. Mm -hmm. Or previous uh, for for organizations that are getting grants and want to help uh, spread the word to different community members, I think uh, you guys have been a really nice help with translating flyers and things like that. So it's really nice to see all these different events, and it's such a great cause. I really liked the co the concept of Welcoming Week. So good job. Thank you. That's really nice to hear. Um, I was jealous that I didn't attend the cooking <laughs> class because it looked really fun, and I love to cook. So that, that seemed like a good one to be at. It was also nice to see a, a, a member of our panel uh, in that photograph. <laughs> 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 nice to see you featured, Sarah. Yeah. It's also nice to see that you're, you know, you were all around the community. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think I remember in the years past, Welcome Week has been primarily on campus, so it's really nice to see that you're just spreading with the, your events all around the community, so it's making it more accessible for a lot of people who may not feel uncomfortable or can't easily go to the campus for some of the events. So it's really nice to see that. Yeah, that's definitely our goal to disperse them around the community. And I didn't mention this before, but we spent a good deal of time before Welcoming Week dropping off these materials at all of our sponsors' locations, as well as, I think, 13 um, public schools so that they could pass the pocket guides out to families. Um, so we really tried to get the word out and have events that were near where people lived and accessible. comments no well thank you so much for your work and thank for you all. To, thank you. to share all your good news with us <laughs> thank you very much thank you now we next we have this is both it's just Cindy Cindy Ogwal uh, coming to report on her arts grant from 2021 oh it's a typo here thank you okay I wondered about that <laughs> I thought I, w I think I was there at your <laughs> presentation on <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome back. Thank you for having us again. I have to pull this up again. Oh, they logged me out. Thank you. All right.
Sorry about that. All right. And I have to go. Yeah. And then I have to go back and show you a video afterwards just in case. But hello, everyone. My name is Cindy Ogwal, and I am one of the co-founders for the CU Black and African Arts Festival, alongside with my sister-in-law, Susan Ogwal, who couldn't be here tonight with us. Um, so <clears throat> a little bit about CU Black and African Arts Festival. We are a nonprofit organization that was started in 2019, and our mission is to expose and give a culturally diverse experience to the Champaign-Urbana and Midwest region um, by expressing both black and African heritage activities for our festival includes, but is not limited to, art, music, fashion, resources, foods, and various business vendors. Um, our general admission is usually free. It was still free this year as well. Um, and we're hoping to keep it free. Uh, so this year, we were able to have a two-day festival with the kickoff partnering with Cranert Center, who hosted the Soul Rebels um, from New Orleans. They were a band. Um, and so Friday night was our kickoff on September 9th. Um, and then the actual festival happened on September 10th. Um, this was our wonderful flyer um, that got promoted throughout. And our, some of our festival highlights, I would say that we actually um, were actually proud of was um, having three food major um, food vendors, um, one being a Congolese uh, restaurant called Le Gourmet. Um, we were really excited about that because we've always wanted to partner with the Congolese community since they are a big African <laughs> um, group here in the Urbana area. So we were able to get them to come out. Um, and then Stango was able to partner with a Nigerian um, caterer this year. So we were able to get some jollof rice and some egusi and fufu from the West African um, region, which is Nigeria. And so it was amazing to see everyone kind of enjoy <laughs> the food and rush to it and know that they, they were there. So um, a couple of our highlights this year, I would also say was that we um, had over 1,500 people in attendance. Um, I want to say about over 2,000, <laughs> but we'll stick to 1,500 within the, the the two days of our festival. Um, we had 29 plus volunteers. Um, and then we also had uh, collaborating sponsors, um, MTD, Remax, um, and um, here's a couple of pictures of our the people who participated in the festival. You'll see some, some of our artists. Um, there was a woman who was locking hair at the festival. Um, some of the kids were uh, dancing. We had a kids' corner, which I will highlight here in a minute. Uh, so our, kid corner, our kids' corner this year was sponsored by WILL, um, PBS Kids. They usually are a sponsor. So um, along with the Anchor Church, who provided balloons animal um, balloons for the kids. Uh, I would say a highlight from the kids' corner was receiving a book. Each year, WILL likes to promote a book that's culturally related to Africa. Uh, so the kids were able to get a book. And then the newest thing that we had was a project from WILL that allowed kids to learn about Africa and black African inventors. So you would see that here on the side. And so our vendor lineup, we had over 30 vendors this year. Again, um, as far as Chicago, St. Louis, Iowa, Indiana, Springfield, and most importantly, our local vendors were able to indulge in this year's festival. I would say a lot of them usually um, 
make their money <laughs> from um, participating in this festival. So that's something that we are actually proud of is, you know, we, we see people who are entrepreneurs and first time um, vendors who are small businesses participating in our festival and giving them that opportunity really means a lot to us in our, um, in, in our uh, organization. So here are a couple of uh, vendors again and resources and food. And this year we also had uh, artists line up. We had seven artists line up at the festival. One of our biggest highlights was Urbana High School step team. They actually participated and it was wonderful to see their principal represent them on the sidelines and him being so excited. Um, and we also had the Royal Destruction Dance Troupe. So just watching all the people in the community come and embrace the kids, that was one of the highlights, I would say. And our, we also had a live pa painter who painted Michelle Obama upside down. So that was really fun to see. I, I think you can see her on the side right there. So this year we were able to use funds to pay for our event logistics and um, we would like to thank the Urbana Arts Grant and the committee for your continuous support. Um, and I would like to play a quick video, but I'm gonna have to log out of here. We young guys, oh, last, last, now everybody go to our breakfast. Shayo. Shayo. Chuko pao for the risotto. Nothing to discuss, oh. Cause I did win by the default, I'm without any doubt, oh. I'm a me, I be a tonto. I no go feed the girl. I no go feed the girl. It's out though. I'm a mind that's with the talk. Oh. I put my life into my job, and I know I'm in trouble. She manipulated my love. Oh. Mm -hmm. I know holy, and I know that capo. Like the Baba Frayo, my ayo, don't cry yo. I need you more and shadow. I need you more and shadow. I need you questions <laughs> where can you buy some of those clothes <laughs> are they all out of town or the vendors that sold clothes and jewelry are they in town um we had local vendors um and some of our vendors were from chicago mm -hmm. st louis springfield um iowa we get people from iowa ohio sometimes oh. so yeah How was your attendance? Based on the pictures, it looks like you had a lot of people. We did. That's why I said I think we had over 2,000 <laughs> instead of 1,500. But it, the attendance was really great. I think, you know, we started in 2019. People heard the little buzz. And then 2020, we went into COVID. And then 2021, people came out. And then, you know, it just it, it blew up after that. So everyone's like, we need to be there. <laughs> and I also, I just love seeing the kids dancing. Like that was just, just yeah, a great charming. part of it. Like everyone was participating, it was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's great. And I, I, I think, I, don't, I know it's a lot of work for all of you, but it would be wonderful if it was like twice a year or something like that. I'm just, I know. <laughs> we we like, get that a lot. I know, it seems like, like, it seems like, the, like the fall, you know, with every, there's so much going on in the fall, right? You yeah. know, in the early fall. Um, and mid-fall, and it seems sometimes like, like there's so much going on in one weekend, 
and you want to go to everything and you can't, right. but it would be wonderful if um, there was a way for you to do it a couple times a year. And I'm thinking the same way that the folk roots are. You know, there's a lot of yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of these festivals. I'm thinking like it's all in one weekend, just a couple of days, and I'm like I can't get to everything that I want to get to. Um, I don't know. It's a lot to do, but I was was wondering, have you ever thought of doing something in a smaller, you know, make perhaps not as. If there was a position no created for that, <laughs> we can make something happen. <laughs> but, um, you know, but we do get that question a lot. Some people are like, can you guys do it for like a whole week or a weekend or, you know. Um, we've considered or we've talked about possibly like February, one in the spring or one in the fall, but that's something that our team is going to have to be prepared for because it takes a lot of work to put that one together <laughs> and a lot of money. <laughs> Great job, Cindy. Yeah, Thank it's, you. Uh, it's always so, I've, I've been, I was there um, last year and I think I uh, stopped by for a little bit this past year and it's just so nice to see Lincoln Square Mall filled with amazing oh, yeah. people and vendors and I feel like it it makes the, the mall come to life and yeah. you do a lot of really good work and it's nice to see so many vendors and for it, it just starting in 2019, I feel like it's really impressive and you should be proud of your work. And Thank you. Yeah, excited thank to you. see what you guys do in the future. Thank you. And, you're and the lucky thank you guys for the money too. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we're able to keep going, you know, so. You have a fee that the vendors pay for their booths? Yes, we do. We do. This year, we had to go up on cost because everything went up for us, including the event space. And I would say that was a little bit of a barrier this year, too. Just everything just going, everything, you know, the inflation of everything. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Came. Yeah, mm -hmm. they did. Yeah. Surprisingly, we were scared. <laughs> And we still had 30 plus, so we we're like, okay, we're doing something right. Yeah, great, wonderful. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. And last but not least, we welcome back Rob Crum from the CU Folk and Roots Festival with his grant review of, from 2020. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Right. So my name is Rob Crum. I, I know most of you all. I've been here before for project reports and proposals. And I uh, just want to say I'm here tonight with Rob Sweedler and Kathy Spiegel. They're two members of our team. So um, we have a group of um, about 16 people that work year round on the festival. And so uh, this year, yeah, uh, the Folk and Roots Festival was the 14th annual festival and uh, was in October. Uh, in the fall, the busy fall. Um, so I hope uh, I hope if you made it, that's great. And if not, you know, try to catch up with us next year. So I handed out um, program. That's the festival program, and this kind of this kind of encapsulates, uh, you know, kind of like everything that leads up to the festival and the festival schedules in the middle. Um, you can see there's lists of supporters in there and people that advertise with us and we get support from them. So it really is a, it's a huge effort, um, community effort. And so um, we had 65 events this year, um, 39 of those were free. So about, you know, more than half of the festival is free and uh, it's more than performances. We do a lot of workshops and uh, dances and dance lessons came back this year after a little bit of a COVID enforced break. Nobody wanted to dance, uh, partner dance anyway. And uh, so we do events for kids of all ages and jam sessions. And um, so since 2020, uh, we did a 
in 2020, we did a completely online festival. We streamed performances, and so we kept that as part of the festival for the last two years. So we did have live performances, you know, attended by people in person, but we also streamed some of the content from the Rose Bowl. And we had um, daily attendance of about four to 600 people, and I'll go along with Patrick. It's, it's tough to catch, uh, get a good count uh, every day, but uh, we do try to count at events. So um, the festival venues um, are mostly all in downtown Urbana, and that's where the festival has been since year one, and so uh, we really believe, you know, that downtown Urbana is just a great fit for the Folk and Roots Festival. So we, we do start Thursday night at the Cranert Center. That's something that's been going on almost since year one. And we have branched out to include the Channing Murray Foundation on Thursday night as well. So there's a good flow of people from the uh, Cranert Center to the Channing Murray uh, Foundation which is just about a block away. But after Thursday, everything, all of all the festival events are in downtown Urbana. And uh, like I said, downtown Urbana works just great for the festival. People love to come to the downtown area and hang out there. And, you know, all they have to do is, is uh, you know, drive or take the bus. And once they get there, they can walk to all festival venues. So um, the festival venues this year stretched really from the Porch of the Common Ground Food Co-op to the Rose Bowl. That's kind of the north-south extent. So, you know, that's a pretty easy walk. Um, so we did get a $9,000 grant funding, and we use that for performer bookings and technical support uh, for our sound and stage crew, uh, for graphic design services, promotion, and space rental. And so uh, we really are very thankful uh, for the arts grant program. It really helps, helps uh, keep it helps us keep the festival, you know, a lot of events for free and helps us pay those expenses. So there's just a couple photos of opening night at Cranert Center. We had Earl White String Band. Earl is a black fiddle player and um, uh, Earl's uh, somebody I've heard of for years. He's from Virginia yeah, but and never really gigs up this way. And Earl is kind of a, I won't say he's like a throwback kind of person, uh, player, but you know, um, there's, there's just not a lot of black fiddle players uh, anymore. Uh, it's too bad. It used to be really a rich tradition. And so we were happy to have Earl, and, and they were everywhere um, during the festival. Earl basically agreed to do as many things as we asked him. It was really great to have him and his band here. So there's just some more um, photos from opening night. Uh, there's some um, uh, pictures from Cranert. Um, the Torino family band, Tom, Tom and Matt Torino and, and friends and family, also played at the Cranert Center. Um, we had um, uh, Dorothy uh, Matriano and Almost A play at um, Channing Murray, and then there was a, uh, one band at the Rose Bowl later that night. So that's kind of, I just want to put in a few pictures for some things that happened. So we did a music in the schools program. We try to do this every year, and uh, some years it happens, some years it doesn't, but we were really happy. This is another event that uh, Earl White and his band, they agreed to play. Uh, we arranged a performance at, uh, at Dr. Uh, Williams School, and uh, that went really well. That was Friday, um, I think it was Friday morning, and it was a school assembly, so everybody, all the students were there. There were, uh, atten attendance was about 400 people. Mostly kids, you know, who had never really uh, heard this style of music before. We had really good response from the faculty and the kids uh, seemed to enjoy it. So then this kind of, we just rolled into um, Friday night um, in and around downtown Urbana. This is just a sampling of some of the performers. And uh, I do want to point out that we had um, this uh, sax player from uh, New York. His name is Eddie Barbash. And Eddie uh, plays in the house band on the Stephen Colbert show. And maybe not anymore. They kind of had some personal changes recently. <laughs> but the, he has been doing that. And so Eddie uh, works with this Casa String Quartet. They're all from California. And so that's one of the pictures there is the string quartet. Um, and I like to show this because I think it's probably the first string quartet that's ever played at the Rose Bowl. 
So, um, you know, uh, maybe I'm going to say that's it's probably the probably the first like national string quartet. Maybe some local string players have played there, but it was really a cool jazz, uh, classical music mashup kind of event. It was really well attended, and uh, Eddie was everywhere. He was just, um, he seemed to just pop up at, at jam sessions. And there's some other photos. There's uh, one of Dom Flemons, who he's kind of our unofficial festival troubadour. Dom um, has been part of the festival for the last three or four years, and um, played to a packed house at the Rose Bowl. Um, a lot of other stuff happening on Friday night. So Saturday, our daytime events, we do, this is when we do a lot of the uh, programs, what I, what I call for kids of all ages, family-friendly programming and hands-on um, activities. So um, that's one thing that makes uh, this festival a little different than, than most, is most festivals are performances, but we really like to engage people. Uh, we do jam sessions and workshops and um, you know, I'll some try to get people involved in some hands-on activities. So there's one sh uh, shot of what we call the Musical Mayhem Parade. That's Emily McCown uh, playing her accordion. And then uh, in the middle of the Irish Jam, there's the sax player. There's the saxophone player. That's Eddie Barbash. Like I said, he just showed up everywhere. So he was at the Irish Jam session. You know, you don't see a saxophone too much in the Irish Jam sessions. But uh, he, like I said, he's like everywhere. There's another photo of Dom Flemons kind of on the lower left. His, um, he is uh, great with uh, people at his workshop at the library. And there's a couple more shots of workshops that happen during the day. Then we rolled into Saturday night, uh, more performances. There's um, another genre buster that's Layla McCalla playing her fiddle, or her cello rather, at the Rose Bowl. And, um, and there's uh, Earl White again with his band, one of his band members. And look, there's Eddie again. So like I said, Eddie, Eddie just showed up everywhere. And really, I, I point this out because this is the kind of musician we love to book at the festival. Somebody who's basically just will throw themselves into you know, jamming with people, going to a jam session. Eddie did a workshop presentation earlier that day, and so, um, you know, it, it won't be a big surprise if we see him again soon. He was really uh, just a knockout performer, and, uh, and it just, you know, like I said, he's just exactly the kind of person we'd love to book at the festival. So a few more shots of, um, I should mention, you know, we did use the Rose Bowl tent. They, the tent was still up. And uh, so we had people inside and outside of the Rose Bowl all weekend. And, you know, we were blessed on Saturday, Festival Saturday, with a really mild October day. And people showed up in droves. It was just a nonstop action in downtown Urbana. It was really cool to see people, uh, you know, on the streets. One of the business owners on Main Street said she had a lot of, a lot of business, you know, people walking through. Um, her her space so anyway uh, was really great so um, the the grant program the arts grant program I would just point out it's a part of part of a network of our supporters and donors so I'm not going to read through this but you know we uh, we did uh, get a grant this year from the National Endowment for the Arts through the Arts Midwest program that was new for us this year so that was nice we have a lot of local businesses and um, and organizations that support the festival, you know, pretty much on an annual basis, and so most of those are listed there. You know, we get donations from individuals. Um, uh, we have about 70 people volunteer during the festival just to support the festival. So, you know, there's 280 volunteer hours right there just, the, just during the three days of the festival, and there's, you know, uh, this core group of us, 16 people, we work year-round. We put hundreds of hours in on the festival. And, you know, it's really what I view it as is, is, is uh, well, personally, and I think, you know, really it's our collective community service effort. It's really what we could do for Urbana. Um, so we, we just, um, you know, um, love having the festival. You know, the big question when you plan events is who's going to show up, right? So you can, you can plan and plan and plan. And thank goodness, you know, a lot of people showed up this year. So I think really we, we had 
you know, about 2,000 people uh, over the course of the festival. That includes about 400 people at the school program. But uh, that was that's probably more. That's probably the best festival attended festival of all. And so we'll roll into next year with the 15th annual festival. So uh, we look, we're looking forward to that. Again, we're going to do it in October. You know, I wish it's something we could do twice a year for sure. But uh, we. You know, like, like Pygmalion, we do some events through the year, so, um, you know, that is something that we are involved. Um, like with the Urbana Park District, we do what's called Folk and Roots Fridays um, there during the summer uh, at Crystal Lake Park with the Urbana Park District. We have, we've had some events through the summer where we, where we you know, uh, have fundraising events or we support other shows. But um, anyway, so there's the festival team and... Um, you know, take, it does take a, take a big effort to put all this together. So anyway, so that's it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, there's, there's an advantage of being last in the lineup. You know, <laughs> everybody gets to this part of the program and they're numb and want to go home. And, but I will entertain any questions <laughs> that you might have. I'll just say, I think it's great that you and the other festivals came back after COVID. It, that would have been the perfect excuse to just say, we're done, <laughs> you know, and moving on to other things. So the fact that you've come back and the audience came back is really exciting. You know, and really, it just seem, it seems to me that people are just, they really want to get out and do things, you know, really. I mean, like I said, Saturday of the festival this year, you know, we were so blessed with the weather. We, we, we planned a, a fair number of outdoor events anyway, you know, with the hope that we would get, you know, decent enough weather. And, and that really, it turned out, those, those outdoor events were just, they were so well attended. You know, we had a couple jam sessions on the food co-op porch just right across the street, you know, and there were a lot of people there to, like, kick off the day. That was really great to see. And we had events out inside and outside at the library this year. We, we used that uh, Cherry Alley performance space. And you know, those, those performances were well attended too, but the, the crowd at the Rose Bowl outside just, it knocked me out. I know um, Rob plays with Hot Club of Urbana. When, when was your gig this year? The, it was about five o'clock? Yeah, so, I think there was 100 people at least. Oh, I mean, that was, that was just under the tent. So uh, Rob's band, they played maybe five or six o'clock on Saturday. And, you know, I was just, I, I ha happened to have some free time then, so I went over and hung out there for a while, and it just, just blew me away how many people were, were out, so. Well, I'm amazed, because I've been around long enough to remember the time when you and your colleagues first came to right. the commission upstairs. Right, <laughs> We had right. a meeting in the meeting room up there, right. making your first proposal, so it's really wonderful to see what you've done since that time well yeah for sure I mean it's you know we have a good group of people working on the festival I would say that's kind of I think really the key to how this festival keeps going is you know people are interested they're involved and and people are so you know generous with their time and you know we have built up a good a good following a good reputation I think um, so the people will people show up to support the festival even if they haven't heard of the performers, you know, before, but. Um. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I had to go out of town that weekend, so I just caught as much as I could before leaving town, and I was trying to get back in time, and it was really cool to see that there were so many events just throughout those, you know, four days that um, for folks who can go during the day, they can go during the day, for folks in the evening, go in the evening, and I was just really thankful that there was such a diversity of events. Um, and I was really thankful that I could actually catch something before I yeah. <laughs> went out of town because before, when I've been, been here in town, I could, you know, I, I, w I had no problem. But it just seems like that there was a lot more events than in the past, uh, more performers in the past. Is that is that my sense, or am I wrong? I mean, I think that? we're we're finally getting back to what you know I would say is a full festival schedule. Okay. You know, about 65, 70 events. Um, you know it. Uh, so, like I said, 2020, we did a completely online festival. So, you know, that I think that was part of just keeping going is, you know, we kind of circled the wagons. And, you know, I remember having a conversation with Rachel uh, Storm. And, you know, it's like, Rachel, like, what, sh what should we do? And, 
you know, should we do a festival? What, what are we going to do with the money, you know? Like, we already had a grant. And so Rachel was very supportive, you know, about exploring online options, and we did. And, you know, we did keep going through that year, which was really good. And, you know, uh, the streamed festival was, you know, um, kind of well attended, for lack of a better term. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people tuned in. And so then the, the following year, you know, I think it was good to get going again in 2021. And, you know, we did have really good attendance last year as well, but, but, but not like this year. This year, like I said, it just kind of blew me away. But, but we did have a really, you know, the weather gods were nice to us this year. There's been times when that hasn't been the case. So. Well, it's always enjoyable to see all of the lineups and see how many different uh, organizations you work with within one festival and I love seeing all the different um, spots that you can get like you can see performances so really you do such a good job in collaborating and kind of bringing bringing people into Urbana so thanks thanks for all of your hard efforts you. and I thanks think it's so. amazing to see all of the what did you say like 12 12 or so uh, folks on your festival team it seems like it's really well supported so mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. So. And how many total different venues are there? I'm starting to count them up, but then it's, it goes oh, across the page. Oh well, <laughs> I think like on Friday night, I think we had seven, and um, yeah. you know, then it it kind of change. It kind of changes in you know each kind of like the day day by day scenario sure. because you know uh, during Saturday. I count seven again, so there's about seven going at once, but, um, you know, we had, this year we had, um, and every year really, the last several years, the Unit One program at Allen Hall um, provides support for one artist. They supported Layla McCalla. She came up from New Orleans and her band, and um, so they had three stops on their tour that they did. Uh, they, they played uh, in, they played the night on the night before they showed up here. They played at the Sheldon in St. Louis, which is a small theater, but a nice theater, really great performance venue. Then they played here at the Folk and Roots Festival, and then they put, then they played at the Ryman Auditorium on the way home. So, you know, and then the next the next week or the week after that, um, they indeed did play Carnegie Hall. So, um, the, it was probably our last chance to book them because <laughs> you know when you. When, when the band plays Carnegie Hall, you know, the booking fee the next year is probably going up. But, um, but we, we enjoyed having them. And, you know, the reason I mention Allen Hall is they, they were really helpful to get Layla here without their support. And so they had some performances. They had a performance open to the public at Allen Hall, but they also had some things going on just, you know, just for the students there. And then I should also um, give a big um, thanks to... Uh, Scott Schwartz at the Sousa Archives and Center for American Music, you know, they're on campus. So uh, Scott's really a big supporter of the festival and he was really uh, very instrumental this year to get Eddie Barbash to come and play here. Um, one of the reasons is his son uh, plays in the band. So uh, there's a little bit of a you know, motive there. But, uh, uh, you know, like I said, Eddie came with his band. I think that was five players. And then they brought the Casa String Quartet, you know, so that was nine. And they basically, you know, half the band came from New York and half came from California. And, uh, you know, um, the booking fee was pretty, you know, pretty stiff, but, you know, well worth it. I mean, you know, you need to pay people if they're coming, right? So, uh, so Scott was very, you know, really helpful uh, to help support, you know, both of those both of those bands at the festival. So, you know, big time thanks to Scott. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, thank Rob. You. Thank you, thank you. It's great you. to see you su continue your success. Thank you. Oh, put all these goodies away. Now we have a staff report. I'll go quick. Okay, Guys, thank you, Stephanie. We've had since I started. <laughs> <laughs> We had a lot of good stuff to talk about today. Thanks, some great sure. reports tonight. Yeah. So, uh, so, thank you guys. Thank you. I am very excited to tell you we finally posted the position. Yes. 
I was going to be very upset if I had to come and tell you we were still waiting. So um, I sent the link to all of you if you're able to share that with people. We, I'm told we do have a few applicants. The, the posting will stay open until we hire someone. Uh, this position is a little different. Rachel was the arts director. This is a, a specialist position, so it's kind of a, a little bit, it's below a director, so we'd give somebody a chance to come in and learn the ropes, get familiar with the program. It would also provide a growth opportunity for someone, um, and that way we also hope someone doesn't expect to ha walk in the door and do everything Rachel did when she left because we all know she was doing a lot. So um, we kind of decided to start at this level and grow someone into a director position someday. So please help spread the word. I hope we can do some interviews after the first of the year. I would love to get someone in as soon as possible because the grant program opens January 2nd. And I would love to have someone learn that program this year. Um, but I don't know if it'll happen quite as quick as I want. I move faster than municipal government. <laughs> uh, but I do still have Heather Ann helping out um, as a temp, and she will be helping with that process too. So feel free to take as many copies of these as you want, or if you want me to print out more for you, I'm glad to do that. Well, so. also posted on Facebook, I noticed. Has it been posted yet? I, yeah, I shared it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and you know what, I'll make sure our communication specialist does that too. I should have done that myself. Um, so we can get the word out more. Uh, as I already mentioned, the arts grants are going to applications will open January 2nd, and they'll be open through the month of January. So I'll be uh, getting myself together. We'll be having juries for some of the uh, grants. I have to refresh myself on all of that, but there'll be a lot of activity through those applications. Heather Ann and I intend to update the video that uh, Rachel had done on how to apply on Neighborly so that people can watch that at their convenience and go step by step, which is what I will need to do to, to learn that. But we're going to update that instead of holding a series of in-person workshops. Um, but I will be available, Heather Ann will be available if um, applicants have <coughs> questions and want to apply and want to discuss projects, we're, we're glad to do that. And if any of you are interested in my sharing your name or email, um, I, I would love the help <laughs> if it comes down to that. And please, if you have people you know who are interested in applying for arts grants, you know, talk, talk them through the process. We can sit down together and go through that together, whichever you guys want to do. So, and where all will that be posted? Uh, it'll be on the Urbana Arts and Culture Facebook page, and we'll up, the website will be updated with the link. I think it already is. We'll put it on the regular Urbana page. I'll do a press release, and um, I'm open for suggestions. So. Any of the job posting sites, you know, like Oh, Indeed yeah, our HR department. I think they usually put on Indeed now. Mm -hmm. uh, they they usually do all of the posting and promotion of the job. What about the neighborhood next door, that app too? Yeah, I'll find out where all uh, they post. Promoted. Okay, then I'm going to ask Sarah to give an update. So I'm excited to announce that um, we have our third Poet Laureate uh, for the city of Urbana. Um, that is Janelle Davenport Pleasure. So we had amazing, a um, uh, lot of talented applicants. Um, uh, so we, we've just reached out to encourage them to apply for next year, but we uh, the jury um, was drawn to Janelle Davenport Pleasure's proposal due to her strong spoken word and poetry performance skills um, and substantial experience creating arts-based programming for a wide and diverse range of local populations spanning socioeconomic, ethnic, cultural, and age different uh, backgrounds. Um, Janelle is uh, an author and also a spoken word poet, like I mentioned, but also an avid dancer, jewelry, recycled clothing designer, and uh, even uh, in one of the, the Urbana Free Library presentations today, uh, she was mentioned for leading a, a children's um, poetry workshop. So we're really excited to be working with her and finalizing some details. Um, but yeah, we're excited um, to 
uh, see all the different projects that Janelle will be doing as the next poet laureate. So, yeah, Have that's. You been informed that Yes, okay. yes, and we're <laughs> we're going to be sending um, out a, I'm going to be working with Stephanie to send out a little uh, press release, um, and then we'll officially announce it, so Super. hopefully, let me be in, I'll check with you on what, what timeline works best, but yeah. yeah, we're finalizing all the details, so yeah, yeah I think right. she'll be really good. And thank you so much, Sarah, for your, your help in putting the word out and pulling together a jury and accepting applications. So yeah. she she agreed to take that on so we could move forward with the program. So I really appreciate the help with it's, that. It's a lot of fun, and we've heard back from we've heard back from uh, other applicants that they're really excited and they wish um, the next poet laureate well and that they're interested in in collaborating in the future. So I think there will be a lot of really aw awesome. Uh, uh, poets doing cool work this next year, so. That's great, very exciting. Um, I have emailed Eka to see the status. I think the mural is done. It looks done to me, but I haven't figured out the VR or the virtual reality. Do you know how that works? I think she said, I saw her at the mistletoe market and she said that she's paused for the winter. Okay. But it's possible that she'll, in the springtime, she'll Finish, finish, finish. Okay, so there is more to come, <laughs> but I wondered, I knew the weather was catching up with her a little bit, so I'll, I'll try to stay in contact with her, but if you cross paths, let me know right. also. And then I didn't have any events on my radar. I've been uh, watching for things that comes, come across our desk and Facebook and reposting them so we can keep the Urbana Arts and Culture page as up to date as possible. But if you become aware of things, feel free to send them to me and we'll, we'll post them and promote them further. So other than that, we are still accepting applications for the two remaining seats on the board and the youth seat. So uh, for our January meeting, I already have two arts grants presentations scheduled and I will probably only allow like five or six at a meeting because you know, we go, I don't want to keep them waiting or, you know, but, you know, we're trying to close out some 2021 and then the 2022s will be closing out as we uh, head into 2023. So do you guys have any feedback or questions for me? Thanks for all your hard work. And yeah. Thank you. Well, I said we're just everything. keeping the doors open at this point, but. You're wearing multiple hats. Yes. So I appreciate you guys hanging in with me. We're we're going to get a staff person in here and hopefully get things rolling. Sounds great. Thank you. I'm just looking, but this is. I think I grabbed something else because this says city of. This is this, this is city. Oh, art. that's tomorrow. That's, that's for tonight. This next week. Yeah, I grabbed that by mistake, and I'm going. There's one more item on the agenda. You no, can stay. There, it starts at 7 o'clock, and we'll probably go till I'll 10 o'clock tonight. I'll There's ARPA here. application. I'll leave yeah. it here for some Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need tonight, to tomorrow night, and Thursday night, those applicants are presenting to city council. So. Mm, that is a lot to go through. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do we, so there's no new business to discuss. So that leaves only one more item. To, well, I'll say two because I want to wish you all a very happy holidays and stay safe and healthy and, and uh, lots of time with your loved ones. And we need a motion to adjourn. I, I motion to adjourn. <laughs> Seconded. There was such pressure to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> that was a teaser. And we, we, we have, do we need a second? Uh, second. Thank you. All motion. in favor say aye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.